The temples and tiers of the kingdom were one of the most highly anticipated elements of the game. The prospect of returning to traditional dungeon formats was something that excited many fans, including myself. But one aspect of the temples that we didn't know a lot about prior to the game was the lore behind them and what their significance to the game's world would be. It turns out, some of the temples are pretty rich in backstory, while others you can only speculate on based on the architecture and other elements of the temple. Each of the four main temples is connected to one of the races of Hyrule, as well as the mysterious Zonai people. In this video, which is an expansion on a previous theory, I'll be breaking down the lore of the Rito, Gerudo, Zora, and Goron dungeons, and what they can each tell us about each clan's relationship with the Zonai. Spoiler warning, we'll be talking about the different designs of each temple, their connections to the Zonai, and their place in the wider Zelda lore. So if you haven't done these temples or some of the related side quests or geoglyph memories, spoilers are ahead. We know that through the Zonai Hylian Alliance, Sonia and Rauru founded the Kingdom of Hyrule. But prior to that, there were several distinct groups coexisting in the land, each with their own leadership structure. Other than one scene where Ganondorf takes a knee and falsely pledges loyalty to the new kingdom, we don't actually know how that unification process went down. However, there are small details in the temples which appear to be collaborations between each race and the Zonai that serve as indicators that allow us to speculate on the relationship between them. The first temple I want to cover, which has the most associated lore and serves as the basis of this theory, is the Stormwind Ark, or the Wind Temple. When we first arrive in Rito Village and begin this quest, we learn that the Rito have a legend, now considered to be a kid's song, about a great flying boat that was given to the Rito in a time of great upheaval. The legend reads, Once a god fell from heaven, stilling the Hebra winds. The heavens grew lifeless, just as the air below thinned. With the world in upheaval, we pledged to help the Lord, a line of ships soaring built as a passage skyward. The god ascended to heaven, leaving behind an ark. Its winds brought us new life thanks to its great divine spark. After journeying into the skies and into a massive storm cloud, we discover that the legends are true and that there is in fact a giant flying ship, as well as hundreds of smaller flying ships. The Ark itself seems to be a joint work between the Rito and the Zonai, as we see elements of both cultures featured on the Ark, suggesting collaboration between the two cultures. So what does this mean for the Rito, and their part in the unification of Hyrule? I think you can read into the Stormwind Ark song in a number of ways. Here's the base level. A god, which we can safely say was a Zonai, fell from the skies, and the Rito built a fleet of flying ships to help him return to the heavens. In return, the Zonai gave the Rito an arc that seemed to generate new wind power for them through its quote-unquote great divine spark. Based on this journal, it seems the Rito's interpretation of the legend has a positive spin. But to me, there's a darker meaning behind this song. A god fell from heaven stilling the Hebra winds. So something bad happened when the Zonai descended. The winds themselves were stopped, and the Rito need their winds to function as a society. So what if the Zonai brought on this ancient upheaval to force the Rito into building them a sky armada? If the Ark was simply a peaceful gift from the Zonai, why would it be so militarized? As you can see, there are giant cannons on several sides of the Ark. Perhaps, in exchange for restoring the Rito's way of life, the Zonai required a pledge of fealty, and in doing so, secured a flying warship, an army of archers, as well as an airborne fleet. This would of course be a really helpful asset in conquering the other races of Hyrule, so perhaps this is an indicator of their military strategy. Let's now move on to the temple in the desert, the previously buried Lightning Temple. Unlike the last example, we don't get a ton of lore in the lead up to this temple. In the Gerudo shelter, we find a mural, which Riju tells us was painted by ancestors of the Gerudo who were also hiding in the shelter during another disaster. The mural doesn't give a lot of details about the temple itself, but rather serves more as a puzzle roadmap on how to reveal the temple. And after solving the puzzle, which in a familiar twist, uses a triangle of light to reveal the temple, we learn that the Lightning Temple's alternate name is the Mural's Myth, risen from the sands. The actual purpose of this temple is a bit of a mystery, but there are a few interesting tidbits we can pull. The overall structure of the temple is a pyramid-like design, with a wide base and tiered layers. The interior shows both Gerudo and Zonai influences, but unlike the sky arc, the layout here may have greater meaning. For example, the basement of the temple and the higher levels are very different in their design. The base seems to be older and more traditional, narrow tunnels filled with flaming booby traps and graves housing Gibdos. When taking a look at the real world, this suggests a similar function to the ancient pyramids of Egypt, which served as tombs to the pharaohs. 
maybe the bodies that were buried here, rather than in the simpler Gerudo graveyard down below, were given special treatment, possibly due to being ancient leaders of the Gerudo. Like the Egyptians, they appear to have been buried with certain items, including weapons, to take to the afterlife. And while some of the tombs are simply covered by slabs, I'm willing to bet that all these statues are actually sarcophagi of ancient Gerudo queens. I'd argue that the fact that the temple is in direct alignment with a throne room in Gerudo Town may indicate this as well. As you ascend in the temple, however, the influence of the Zonai becomes clear, as there are Zonai devices key to solving puzzles and high-tech batteries used to power the ascension device. All of it seems to be a layer from a different era though, built on top of existing Gerudo architecture and even using different materials. And again, it makes you wonder, what was the Zonai's purpose in building on top of this structure? Unlike the Rito, we don't have any textual evidence regarding the function of the Lightning Temple. If I'm guessing, I would say this temple is an indication of the Zonai giving the Gerudo the power to harness lightning, as all the lightning-related materials are built on top of ancient Gerudo structures. I believe this is the first time we've seen a lightning temple in a Zelda game, but aside from the Zonai influence, the structure bears many similarities to temples we've seen before. There is the Earth Temple from Wind Waker that houses re-deads and uses the Mirror Shield extensively, but thematically, it seems more closely tied to the Spirit Temple from Ocarina of Time, a large Gerudo temple in the middle of the desert that also uses light as a key component. Perhaps this indicates the temple's original function. Before the Zonai inserted their technology, this may have been a pyramid-like tomb that served as the Gerudo Spirit Temple, until the Zonai came along and converted it to a lightning temple. Again, there's no concrete evidence to show that there was a nefarious purpose here, but we know that Ganon, who at the time was the leader of certain factions of the Gerudo, was in conflict with Zonai leadership, and maybe the Zonai infiltration of the Gerudo sacred site indicates why. From Ganon's point of view, perhaps they were desecrating Gerudo tradition, leading to the split in Gerudo aligned with Ganon and those aligned with Raru. Ultimately, we know the Zonai Hylian Alliance succeeded in unifying the groups to form one kingdom, although it resulted in many losses. But other than the Gerudo, who we saw in conflict with the Zonai, we don't know how it all played out. But presumably, however it happened, by the point of Ganon's rebellion, all the other groups had been pulled into the kingdom of Hyrule. As we know, Raru has a trusted group of allies from each race to serve as sages. Clearly, the Zonai on their own were a powerful force. The secret stones alone were enough to take out an entire army of Muldugas. Perhaps their technology was intimidating enough that the other kingdoms joined peacefully, but it's hard to believe that it would have gone as smoothly as that. Ocarina of Time is set against the backstory of a reunified kingdom recovering from a civil war. So historically, in the Zelda timeline, having one group assert their rule over the kingdom hasn't always gone well. Let's now take a look at the Water Temple, also known as the Wellspring of Hyrule. At the start of our quest, we learned from an ancient tablet that to reach the temple, you have to go through a fairly elaborate process. First, you must shoot a scale from the Zora King through a teardrop-shaped rock on a sky island, which then unlocks a portal to the Zora Waterworks below. The Zora Waterworks are a system of pipes located in an underground chamber beneath the reservoir, which, when flooded, allows Link to reach a Zonai-style pedestal at the top. Interacting with this opens up a giant waterfall that connects the reservoir to Wellspring Island far above. Now, at first you might think that this is a needlessly complicated way to access the temple, but there's actually some interesting lore that supports the reasoning behind this, which I'll return to in a bit. But first, let's take a closer look at the Wellspring. To reach the Water Temple, you first have to ascend a chain of islands leading up to the temple, stretching so high that we begin to experience lower gravity. The ruins appear to be ancient Zora in origin, based on the design and materials that are very similar to the modern Zora architecture. They seem to be damp and mossy, and appear to have hosted canals at one point. In between the biggest ruins, there are waterfall generators throughout that would allow transportation for the Zora. The fact that the temple physically requires assistance from the Zora to access, both through the king's scale to activate the waterworks, and in that only Zora, or a Hylian wearing Zora armor, can ascend to the wellspring via waterfall, are our first indicators that there was a positive relationship between the Zonai and the Zora. The waterfalls are a key component here. In the ancient texts, they're referred to as a watery bridge that connects the Zora to the people of the sky, and Sidon even says waterfalls are no different to us than a path. Now that we've taken a look at the approach to the water temple, let's take a look at the temple's design itself. As with the other temples, we can see distinct architectural styles and materials used throughout. However, in my opinion, this appears to be the most cohesive integration of Zonai design of the four temples. There are definitely clear Zora influences, we see Nehru's crest carved into the stonework, 
as well as elephant-like statues pouring down water, perhaps a reference to Varuta. But the Zonai presence here seems to have been built at the same time, rather than having been slapped on later. The Zonai devices throughout seem to be designed with the Zora in mind, using water-based modes of transportation to navigate the space. The design of the water temple sort of disproved my theory that the Zonai were hostile conquerors, but all I can say is that perhaps they were more willing to collaborate with some cultures than others. So, how does the Wellspring actually work? The key bit of lore here actually comes from Breath of the Wild. From the Zora history tablets, we learn that the East Reservoir Lake was constructed prior to the Ancient Calamity, as a joint project between the Zora and the royal family of Hyrule. Every 10,000 years, the region experienced massive rainfall, which led to devastating floods. So, by joining the architectural genius of the Zora and Hyrule's technological prowess, East Reservoir Lake was built, which successfully stopped the flooding. As part of the agreement, going forward, the Zora King would be responsible for managing the reservoir level to protect against any future flooding. The tablets also say that the reservoir symbolizes the bond between Hyrule and the Zora. Since we now know that this Hyrule was founded as the result of a Hylian Zonai alliance, I'd argue that the technological prowess described is actually referring to Zonai tech. The seamless fusion of Zora and Zonai architecture and devices certainly supports this theory. In Tears of the Kingdom, we learn from the Sage of Water that the Wellspring is actually the source of the Zora's waters. We don't totally know how this works, but hazarding a guess, it seems like some sort of environmental control, gathering water in the atmosphere and storing it until it's time to turn the faucets on. The water then falls into the reservoir, and the underground waterworks control the flow, perhaps dispersing the water across Hyrule via the pipes. And per this lore, it is the Zora King's responsibility to manage the reservoir and keep it from flooding, which explains why it takes one of his scales to activate the whole system. And sure, if you want to go to Conspiracy Town, you could maybe argue that there was potential for the Zonai to use the Wellspring as a weapon, either by corrupting or withholding the Zora's waters, or using it to flood the Kingdom of Hyrule, like in Wind Waker. But due to all the evidence that seems to suggest a peaceful collaboration here, I think the Water Temple is an example of the Zonai using diplomacy rather than warfare as part of the unification process. Finally, let's talk about Gorondia. In theory, an ancient underground city originally home to the Goron seems like it would be jam-packed in lore, but we actually don't get a ton of textual information about it, which I honestly kind of felt was a letdown. My feelings aside, let's look at what we do know. A lot of what we learn about Gorondia isn't through the main quest, but rather through side quests and NPCs. A Hylian explorer named Duma and a Goron child named Dugby both talk about wanting to find it. From these conversations, we learned that Gorondia is an ancient underground city that the Gorons lived in in the distant past. Ultimately, we get to see Gorondia for ourselves as part of the main quest when it comes time to explore the Fire Temple. For something that's described as a city, even one that's in ruins, it seemed a little bit barren. Rather than living spaces, the city seems to be composed of several levels of mining equipment. I thought this was really odd and a little unexpected, but the more I began to explore Gorondia and think about it, the more I realized what the dungeon really reminded me of. While the Goron cities of Tears of the Kingdom and Ocarina of Time seem to be much more fleshed out civilizations with shops and living spaces, the Goron civilization of Twilight Princess was much more stripped down. If that game's Gorons had living quarters, they were hidden from Link. All we see from them is a ceremonial wrestling room that is adjacent to the Goron Mines, which serve as the fire dungeon of Twilight Princess. The more I looked at these two sets of dungeons, the more connections I saw between them. Both games' dungeons had lots of mining equipment, of course, but a major gameplay mechanic of Twilight Princess is the magnetic mineral material that lines many structures in Goron Mines, including walls, floors, and even these giant cranes. Huge leap here, but the magnetic material from Twilight Princess sure is a similar color to Zonite. Could that have been what those Gorons were mining? And could this even be the same mine in Tears of the Kingdom? Crazy, right? I thought so too, but then I noticed another parallel. The final boss of the Goron mines in Twilight Princess is called Phyrus, a Goron patriarch who was corrupted by a foreign material and turned into a flame monster. That sounds familiar. But what really struck me here was how similar the room from Twilight Princess was to the Tears of the Kingdom boss room. At first, I couldn't really figure out what the point of this room was. From the outside, it seems kind of like a forge harnessing the lava. But the inside didn't seem to have much purpose, until I started looking for these comparisons. Like Twilight Princess, it appears to be a large ceremonial dome of a room, with a circular floor that could be a callback to the wrestling Gorons of that game. The door to Garandia's boss, while it could be a Dodongo, also evokes Phyrus to me, 
especially the locks, which kind of reminded me of how Fyrus had been chained down. Again, I know this is a stretch, but if Garandia is supposed to be linked to a specific Goron culture, my money is on Twilight Princess. Anyway, back to the overarching theory, how does this connect to the Zonai? I've got to say, I think Garandia is the temple with the least amount of Zonai influence, and maybe there's a reason for that. There are certainly Zonai devices throughout, which appear to assist with the mining process, but it seems like much of the infrastructure is heavily Goron. I'll explain why I think that is, but first, let me talk about what I think the Zonai's motivation for coming down to Hyrule was, because I think it's related. I believe the Zonai descended to the surface because they knew there was a limited supply of Zonite in the Sky Islands. This shortage is confirmed by one of the constructs on the Great Sky Island. So to gather more Zonite and continue to power the technology of their civilization, the Zonai had to find new sources. Ultimately, I believe their purpose in uniting the kingdom and subduing the existing cultures of the land was simply to eliminate any resistance to their mining efforts. So tying this back to Garandia, as Hyrule's premier miners and the only civilization that we know of that lived in the depths, the Gorons would likely be an integral part of the Zonai's mining expeditions. So it would definitely behoove the Zonai to collaborate with them in a peaceful manner. The Gorons had a wealth of skill and knowledge about the area, and perhaps they shared their knowledge in exchange for the Zonai just leaving their civilization alone, using an isolationist strategy against an overpowered enemy. This could explain why Gorondia has very little Zonai influence, and vice versa, why the underground Zonai mines don't appear to have Goron collaboration. So now that we've looked at all the four main temples, let's summarize the theory so far and what we think we can gather about the Zonai's formation of the Kingdom of Hyrule. First, starting with what we actually saw in the game, we know that the Gerudo were the last to join the kingdom, and that they were in direct conflict with the Zonai. Based on this knowledge, and the design of the Lightning Temple, I believe we can safely say this was not a smooth transition. As for the Rito, I think you can interpret their relationship with the Zonai multiple ways. My personal read on the situation was that the Zonai used force against them in order to construct the Stormwind Arc, which they could then use as a tool to intimidate other civilizations. But maybe they didn't need to. The Zora, I believe, had the best relationship with the Zonai. There's no record of an ancient upheaval being used against them, and the design of the temple indicates a largely peaceful collaboration. And lastly, as I just described, I believe the Zonai had the most neutral, hands-off approach when it came to the Gorons, simply accepting their knowledge of mining the depths and, in return, left the city of Gorondia largely alone. So here's my big takeaway from all this. There are many ways to build a kingdom and it seems the Zonai smartly used tailored strategies when it came to each society, likely based on the level of resistance they were met with, or conversely, the ways that the Zonai viewed them as useful. I don't think we can say that the Kingdom of Hyrule was formed entirely peacefully. In some cases, I believe the overpowering might and technology of the godlike Zonai were used for intimidation, but in other cases, they may have been able to use diplomacy or trading their technology to gain cooperation. But wait, what about the Fifth Temple? What's the lore behind the Zonai Spirit Temple, and what could it tell us about the Zonai's quest for… immortality? Building off the analysis from this video, I actually have a separate theory on this that I'll be digging into in a future video, so stay tuned for that one. So let me know what you think! Were the Zonai peaceful uniters, hostile conquerors, or something in between? As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.